Jerry from Berean Nation. I want to apologize in advance for the quality of this video. Sorry, we're trying out software and we're still fine-tuning our process. Hang in there, though. The study is worth it. Keep studying the scriptures daily to see that these things are so. Welcome to our Berean Nation Bible study, everybody. Um, let's open in prayer before we do much else. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here, even if it's just online, to hear from your word and to learn at your feet. Lord, we ask especially that you would open our hearts and minds this evening to hear what it is you have to say to us so that we can make practical application of the things that are in your word for us this evening. We commit ourselves and each other into your hands. In his precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So this week we're actually in Romans chapter 12, the long-awaited. It is actually a longer study as it turns out. Shorter chapter, longer study. Um, but uh, be that as it may, let's read the 21 verses. There's three of us. That's seven verses by Dan's math. <laughs> And maybe what we can do is, uh, Dan, if you'll read the first seven verses, and uh, okay, then if you could read... Okay, break in the middle because I turned the page between verse two and verse three. No worries. And then, uh, uh, Alex, if you could uh, read the next seven, and I'll, I'll finish it up. Okay. Shall I proceed? Yeah, please. Romans 12, verses one to seven. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching. <clears throat> or he is he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give prefer preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Con contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Who persecute you and bless and do not curse. All right. Uh, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, over, do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. We thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Uh, so we always try to conduct a public chapter summary here. And uh, for all of those that have tried to prepare one ahead of time, 
Uh, thank you for muting, by the way. <laughs> um, for all those that uh, try to prepare one ahead of time, we ask ourselves three questions. The first question is, what does the chapter say? Okay, um, this is the part where we summarize the chapter. What I do to summarize the chapter is I read through it and I split it up into thought units or paragraphs. And each paragraph gets a title relevant to what that is talking about. And then at the end, I'll try and find a common theme or a common thread that goes through those uh, little uh, paragraph titles that I've given. And I'll give it an overall title with a supporting key verse from the chapter. And that's really the what does it say part. Um, then, what does the chapter mean, is the second question. Not what does it mean to me, because that's irrelevant. We want to know what it means to God when he says the things that he says in the particular text we're examining. So, um, that's hard to do without the Holy Spirit uh, guiding you into truth, as it were. Uh, if you think you're having that problem, shoot me an email or call our new Berean Nation number, which is actually up on our website right now, and we can have a chat and maybe talk about that. And the third question, finally, is what am I going to do about it? What practical applications can I derive from this? And Sometimes that's really, really specific right down to, I have to do this then. Uh, sometimes it's just a broad stroke general principle, and that's okay too, because we need to learn those to live our lives and make our choices as to what the Lord would have us go about in our daily lives. So did anybody here, uh, by either show of hands, or by uh, saying hi, or yes, or your name, um, have a chapter summary ready to go? My hand is up on purpose. So Alex has one. Hi. Okay, so Sue, did I see your hand go up? No? Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so there are three of us. And, uh, please, uh, Dan, why don't you share your chapter summary with us? Okay, I divided it into three sections, the first being the first two verses, which I entitled, God Asks a Little of Us. Uh, the next section is uh, verses 3 through 8. God gives us so much. And uh, verses 9 through 21 I call God gives us good advice. Alright. Fair enough. Go ahead with the rest. Sorry. Didn't mean to. Chaos. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the first two verses... Uh, Paul has established his credentials well enough that he could order people, but he, instead of ordering his readers, he appeals to us. Okay. Present ourselves, all of ourselves, as a sacrifice, not as a dead sacrifice, but as a, a living, continuing sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, and we do this by making sure we are not conformed to this world. Okay. Right. But rather, following the transformation that is working in us by the infilling of the Spirit. Yeah. Uh, the second section, I called God Gives Us So Much. Uh, first of all, every human being, he gives so many different sorts of functionality just physically and mentally. In one body, we have many members. We have uh, feet and legs that uh, help us to move around. We have hands that help us to pick things up and carry things, and so on and so forth. And most of the time, we take that for granted, but that's... God didn't have to do this. He gives us this out of generosity. That's true. Gifts as 
as well. Uh, to some he gives the gift of prophecy, to some he gives the gift of service, to some he gives the gift of exhortation, to some he gives the gift of generosity, to some he gives the gift of leadership. Mm-hmm. The third section, I found this a little hard to summarize, but I summarized it vaguely rather than in as many or more words as the section by just saying God gives us good advice. Okay. Uh, if you're going to love, love uh, for real. Don't pretend to love if you don't. Right. Uh, hold fast to what is good. A lot of this advice can seem like common sense and Though it's an order from God, it's not for God's benefit, it's for our benefit. All of these things benefit whoever does them. Right. Love one another. That doesn't just benefit those we love, it benefits each of us who loves others. Uh, Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in the spirit. And it's Whenever I am fervent in spirit, it's good for me. Serve the Lord. That is the greatest thing of all, and that's the thing that, whenever I do it, is the greatest good for me of anything I ever do. Rejoice and hope. Again, that's good advice, and again, it's good for me to do that. Uh, Be patient in tribulation. Again, if I do that, it's good for me. I'm sure it delights God, but to the extent that it has any practical benefit, the practical benefit is mostly for me. And God keeps giving us this sort of advice gently and patiently. And sometimes we follow it and sometimes we don't, but whenever we follow it, it benefits us. Um, and what we can do about it is to simply follow the good advice in this chapter. And there's no shortage of it, right? <laughs> right. I, I, I could keep going through it, the rest of the verses I haven't covered yet, but I, I, I don't want to bore anyone because I think I've established my pattern. Fair enough. All right, thank you for sharing, Dan. I actually enjoyed that. Uh, Alex, you said you had one. Go ahead and share it with us. Uh, well, actually, uh, <laughs> that's exactly what I what I uh, was about to say. So, Well, if that's repeat. the case and mine's like that too, maybe we should all just go home. What do you think? Oh, wait a minute, we are home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd rather go home than be quarantined somewhere. Wait a minute. Please go ahead, Alex. I'm sorry. I, I I can't help it sometimes. I'm sorry. Well, uh, at the beginning it says, uh, uh, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present. Present is a command. Mm-hmm. So uh, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Um, and, uh, yeah, don't, don't be conformed to the world system, you know, uh, and the world uh, philosophies and and uh, that says, uh, you know, uh, don't listen to Christ, don't listen to, uh, you know, because that's all, you know, old fashioned and yonder all that can, you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, you know, you're you're all you're you're backwards, you're you know, you're 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 out of touch with with uh, 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 reality, right? Sure. Um, sure I am. For me? Sure I'm out of yeah. touch. Sure go I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um but uh Jesus clearly uh uh commands us to well Paul uh uh clearly commands us to uh uh renew our minds and learn the word of God every day. Um uh, and of course, the, you know, he goes on and, and says there's, uh, 
there's one body of of, uh, of uh, believers that have very different gifts, um, and uh, also, uh, well, it's it um, going to back to the uh, uh, preceding chapters. Um, of course, he says therefore, right, um, and that that means because of what I said in the previous chapters, now live like a Christian, you know, um, let that be an encouragement to you to, uh, um, live like a Christian. And, and then he, he gives these exhortation, uh, don't let, uh, love be, uh, without hypocrisy, uh, abhor, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, um, love each other, um, in brotherly love, um, Um, yeah, uh, in all, uh, you know, uh, uh, rejoicing in hope, uh, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, we should always pray, <laughs> um, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Um, yeah, uh, we should always be helping each other out. Um, also, um, he also gives us another command, bless those who persecute you. And don't curse. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another one, another command, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Um, and, uh, you know, whenever uh, um, something good happens to someone else in the body, we should rejoice with them. And if something bad happens, uh, we should weep with them. Um and whatever tribulation we we come together and we bear each other's burdens, um, and uh, and also he ends up um, he ends with uh, saying, uh, uh, if possible, so far it depends on you, uh, be at peace with everybody. Uh, but sometimes it can't. <laughs> Sometimes you can't. Uh, so you, you got to, frankly, sometimes cut off some relationships, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, also, and then he follows up with don't don't take revenge on, it, on everybody. Um, right. Because uh, revenge is sin. <laughs> it's basically saying, yep. uh, I don't believe God is going to punish so I'm going to take it into my own hands and basically do my version of justice, but not God's version of justice, because God's justice is is infinitely bigger than mine. <laughs> um, uh, and then he he says, leave, leave it to the wrath of God. You know, leave, let ultimate justice be done by by God. And um, uh, then he quotes from the Old Testament, "Vengeance is mine; I will repay." Uh, which is, um, yeah, it's from the Old Testament. Um, it's from Deuteronomy uh, thirty-two. Yeah. Um, however, um, this is about personal uh, uh, offense. Uh, uh, it's about if somebody has done some to you, something to you personally. Uh, that yes, you are supposed to leave it to the wrath of God, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we can't use government government authorities to also uh, throw down justice on on uh, because they have broken the governmental law, right? Well, we saw that and, actually in the New Testament, didn't we? Yeah. Paul, Paul yeah. in the temple, he said, "Brothers, I see the I I," and and ultimately. No, you know what? I don't trust you guys to handle justice in my case. I appeal to Caesar. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's not wrong to do that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, that's. Uh, and then he ends with "Don't don't overcome evil by evil. Uh, overcome evil with good." Um, yeah. Don't uh, don't do like the pagans do, where it's just you know uh, they just. In a hissy fight, right? You know, <laughs> you just just uh, constantly, you know, it's like it's like, you know, you know, uh, 
like children, right? You know, like they, yeah. you know, one slaps them and then the other one slaps them and then, you know, just slaps all the time, you know? And, Slap fight! Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't be like that. So that, that's my summary. Right on. Thank you, Alex. Very enjoyable. You're welcome. All right. So, um, I guess that makes it my turn, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, as always, I do really feel like um, we need to remind ourselves where we came from so we can purposely fix our eyes on where we're at and kind of explore the surroundings in a, a context of some kind. Um, so in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul introduces himself, his credentials, his audience, and his orchestra. No, kidding. Um, but he begins to speak about the, sorry guys, he begins to speak about the subject uh, we've termed in our understanding radical depravity. Um, he even details it in chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, and he gives both the reasons for it and examples regarding it in the context of the coming and terrible day of the Lord, that wrath of God that uh, Alex was actually speaking of. Uh, and title two, uh, chapter 2 rather, was a, a little more specific because he addressed uh, really a very specific target audience who I you know, poetically refer to as the Jew in the pew. Um, but it, it was, you know, Jewish folks uh, who had perhaps come to some kind of mental assent that Jesus was a man to follow, but they had not... And maybe they even said he was the Messiah. And I've seen this actually in our day where, oh, yes, Jesus is, is God. He's the Messiah. He's really the thing. But um, they haven't made this whole life commitment to him to follow him because they're living like it really doesn't matter. So, uh, you know, there was really perhaps they were just still living in their old Jewish ritual right sign membership in in a certain order like the pharisees or or the scribes or whatever um but paul went on to explain in chapter two that there was no real ritual or rite or sign or place or set of words or actions so no spells to cast uh no member of any specific earthly group can have salvific effect that salvation, the Greek word soteria, really can only come from one source for everyone, and that's Christ Jesus. Jesus alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, as the guys during the Reformation put it. Um, now Romans 3 talks about the straight-up gospel without apology, um, and it tells us not only why we need to be saved, but how we need to be saved, when we need to be saved. And we need to be saved because of that coming wrath, but all of the details of how that happens. And, and then it says in chapter 4, uh, it gives us an Old Testament example and tells us that really salvation by faith alone is not a new thing. Um Abraham was saved or justified um, not by following the law, which was 430 years uh, after Abraham, and it wasn't he wasn't even really uh, saved by circumcision, although that was a sign of this particular covenant. Uh, rather, um, he was saved by faith and believing God. And that's what was reckoned to him as righteousness by which he was justified. And then in chapter 5, we saw how that justification by faith really extended to all of us. Um, and that justified us before God and or acquitted us before God um, of the unrighteousness that we had by our great substitute, Christ Jesus, that took our place in dying for our sins, having lived a perfect life before God and then knowingly and willingly surrendering it. That's right. Jesus was not a victim. Uh, he was an active participant 
And, and it wasn't just all Jesus. The rest of the Godhead was also in on the plan. Um, you know, uh, however, the chapter did speak briefly about something else, and it was called sanctification. And that actually became the main idea of chapter 6, the process by which God uses the difficulties that some say he allows, I say engineers, in our lives to make us more like his son. And that process, as the chapter discussed, literally takes the rest of our lives. Um, but as we surrender to God and his work in our lives through the Holy Spirit within us, he begins to change us. And that kind of hits at the base of the problem. Although we've been born again or redeemed or saved or whatever terminology you want to use here, um, although we're renewed in the Spirit by the indwelling Holy Spirit, we still live in our bodies, and our bodies are literally the flesh. And the flesh and the world system and the devil all still work together together and they fight us every step of the way on the journey. And our own flesh, we're supposed to consider it as dead, but it's not easy because it really isn't. It's still breathing, it's still kicking, and it tries to kick us every once in a while. Um, and, you know, Paul even comments on uh, his own problems, and that's the focus of Jack chapter 7. Uh, his great cry is, O wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it just sort of suddenly breaks into chapter 8 with there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and he talks about the implications of that. But more I think the 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 power behind the new life in Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, also known as the Spirit of Christ, also known as the Comforter, also known as the Paraclete, also whatever, right? There's a lot of names for him. Um, he is the third person of the Godhead in the Trinity. Um, and in chapter 8, we talked about how Christ set us free and how the Holy Spirit has assisted every aspect of our salvation from our basic justification to our sanctification and will feature in our glorification later on. Um, uh, essentially, sorry, it is the, the changed behavior that we have that is a result of that Holy Spirit coming to dwell in our lives that is really the evidence that God has really set us free from the power of sin and death in our lives. He's set us free from its penalty. He set us free from its power. And at some point in chapter 8, it talks about how it's going to set us free from its very presence. And I find that to be most encouraging. Now, um, you know, and instead of walking in the flesh then, um, believers now have the opportunity to focus on the spirit, and I think the desire as well for the most part. Um, and then he talks about it in the second half of chapter 8, how everything works together for good for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then he defines exactly who that group of people are who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, uh, verses 29 and 30, and, and it's really critical that we understand that text. Um, it's that those that God, uh, that group of people contains those that God foreknew, and it, when he foreknew them, he predestined them to belong to his son. And those whom he predestined, he called and those whom he called, all of them, he justified. And those whom he justified, all of them, he glorified. And it's all in the past tense, just to show that as far as God's concerned, this is a done deal, and it actually forms the basis of the doctrine of eternal security, among other things. Um, now, 
it's this group of individuals that God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit will lead all the way to glory with his son um, when he makes us more like him. Um, and we don't really know what that's going to look like necessarily, but we do know this, it'll be glorious. <laughs> uh, and in chapter 9, we, tell, we dealt with the topic of the sonship of believers from the perspective that as we discovered, uh, it didn't really leave it in the hands of Abraham or any of the other fathers or the will of man or the actions of man, but in God's almighty hand alone. Um, yeah, uh, the perspective was that of Paul speaking specifically of those who were given the promises of adoption as sons. Um, sorry, that's the dog you're hearing clunking around. Um, the perspective, the perspe hey Sue, uh, can you get them to calm the dog down, please? Thank you. Um, so he was speaking specifically about those that were given the promises of adoption as sons. And, and in fact, his, his statement, Paul's statement was that there is in fact no difference between those that were given the adoption as sons in the Old Testament and those that were given the adoption as sons in the New Testament. There's no difference. And chapter 10 talks about how everyone has to come by the same salvation to this renewed glorification that's going to come. Um, now, there's not one way for the Jews and one way for the non-Jews. All have to come to, to a faith, and according to chapter 10, a faith that is strong enough to make verbal confession, uh, and, and the more public that confession is, I suppose, the stronger it really is. Now, um, in chapter 11, Paul talked about how he wished he could give up his own place in glory to save his own Jewish brothers. Uh, although that's not really possible, uh, Paul flat out said that a partial blindness has happened and that God is holding at least some of them in reserve at a, at a future point to reveal the truth to them in the eschaton. Now, um, and he does that by talking about what I've termed the Israel of God, uh, which includes all believers from all time, uh, from every tribe, every nation, speaking every language, regardless of gender or economic status or education or, or things like that. Um, and with that knowledge, Paul forges into chapter 12 and, and out of consider uh, that's our consideration in this study, where he turns a sort of a corner in the book um, and he, become, he starts to become very practical uh, in his application for the word to Christians. Um, and let me be, be very clear. If you're not practicing this stuff, don't even pretend to be a Christian. Um, you know, we coined a word uh, a little over 30 years ago, Dan and I did. Uh, I think it was Dan that came up with it first. But we call these people who you know, claim to be Christians, but don't live like Christ makes a difference. We call them churchians. Hmm. And that's... I actually uh, started using that phrase in 1982. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, it was it was you that introduced me to the phrase then. But the point is, is um, there's little or no evidence that Christ knows any one of them. And, you know, we rejoice when that does eventually happen from time to time, but... Anyway, I, I split the chapter up as follows. I took key verse 6a uh, as my key verse, and I called it How the Christian Fits into the Church. I know it's a simplistic title, but uh, you'll hear why in a moment. Now, verses 1 and 2, I, I called Acceptable and Logical Service to God. Verses 3 to 8, The Exercise of Spiritual Powers and Gifts. 
verses 9 to 13, our behavior towards other believers, and 14 to 21, our behavior towards unbelievers. Now, as I said, I took verse 6a as my key verse, and I'll just read it to you. Uh, it says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace that give the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Now, we've been saying for several chapters that all of these things that encourage believers to make choices are really also evidence that the ones who make the right choices are actually Christians. Uh, I know it sounds a little circular, but it's not really. It's um, The others who do not are what we would refer to as churchians. That group of people that are, as far as I can tell, not saved, but still know they are. <laughs> you know, and you better not tell them otherwise. And they usually bully or otherwise manipulate themselves into positions of power and authority within a local gathering. Now, uh, and that's not universal, okay? That's just when they show up, that's what they try and do. Um, Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus in the first place to try and deal with guys that were doing this. Um, you know, um, and he ended up taking care of it by instead of making it about whoever could bully people the best or whoever could filibuster the best, he made it about the moral character of the leader. And that's what you should be paying attention to because all of this is about moral character. And Romans 12 is turning into that corner to describe the morals of the practicing Christian. As if there's a Christian who doesn't practice. In fact, it seems to be all we do is practice. But practice makes perfect. <laughs> By the power of the Spirit. Absolutely. You can't do it without the Spirit. Now, yeah. uh, okay, so key verse 6a, how the Christian fits into the church. I've heard it said um, and I've even heard it taught as doctrine by John MacArthur, no less, and I do truly respect that man, that every Christian has a singular gift from God that he or she is given at salvation that makes them a unique believer within the body of Christ. Now, I'll try and say more in detail on that later, but sometimes it's a blend of things that the Lord puts into you and gifts or and he either gifts it or awakens these things at your salvation and the gift god gave you is meant to bless and edify other members of the church as you exercise those things for his glory now in the context of the church we begin to see that it should be the glory of God that governs our behavior and not our paycheck, if we're talking about pastors, or our popularity for leaders, uh, or our so-called spirituality, um, which is usually pride masquerading as virtue signaling. Now, all that kind of behavior... I'm sorry? Sorry. sorry uh, or virtue twerking. You said virtue twerking? Yeah. Oh, God. I'm muting you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, all that kind of behavior starts to be listed in chapter 12. Uh, let's just jump right in. Verses 1 to 2, acceptable and logical service to God. Now, we should all know that when we were saved by the Lord, we were saved with a purpose. Um, we touched on that in chapter 8 a little bit when we said that all things work together for our good as Christians. Now, if you've never heard this, uh, then it should become clear from that alone that we were so gifted to be in community with each other. Um, our sovereign God has, by the work of Christ, 
made one new man of all believers from all time, from every nation, from every language, irrespective of economic status, social position, education, melanin concentration of our skin, and even our gender. That is a corporate man, the church universal, the Israel of God. Now, as you would expect, since God has given believers a new nature that seeks to please him, it should be no surprise that he's written his law in our hearts and, an inst and given us, instilled in us, an instinct to please him. Now, Paul brings this to a very fine point with the very first word of the chapter, therefore. Everybody's favorite word. Now, verse 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. The English word, therefore, is a connecting word, joining the context of what has just come before, and is preparing our minds for a kind of conclusion which is about to be stated. This is the turning point where Paul moves from deep theology to practical application. And what does Paul say? He says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. The word urge, you want to take a guess at what the Greek word is? <laughs> We've heard it before. Parakaleo. Ah. <laughs> Okay, I mind muting Alex just so he can participate. <laughs> All right. Um, where am I here? <laughs> okay, yeah, so parakaleo. And when it's used like this, it actually has a stronger meaning than, say, to simply ask politely. Uh, the King James translates this here as the word beseech. Um, which means to make an urgent appeal. So Paul is clearly and urgently calling for some kind of response. Mercies here can also be translated as compassion or pity, uh, although I think I prefer the word mercy in this case. Um, so what is call, Paul calling people to do? Well, it says here, to appear, uh, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, and the rest. Now, to, to uh, present it means to appear in person. Okay? Like a court summons. You have to appear in the court in person. Now, To perform a living, and the word is zoe, so life in an absolute sense, and holy, hagion, uh, sacrifice, or thusia, the Greek word for sacrifice. Now, I'm pretty sure everyone here has uh, said it in our minds and, and even meant it, that, uh, you know, if, if it comes, I'll die for you, Jesus. Now, if you were to call us to do that, I'm sure he would give us the grace to go through it. I, I'm a coward. I would be very, very afraid. Um, but having say, said that, I would like to think that the Lord would give me the grace to go through whatever I had to go through. The thing is, that's not what Paul's saying here. <laughs> um, okay. Paul is saying what the Lord is really after out of the gospel that he's just declared for us for the past 11 chapters is that he wants us not to die for him, but to live for him. You know, for those that say that they're being persecuted here in North America, uh, and it is easy to think this way, I have to kind of disagree. I, I don't entirely disagree. I think we're seeing the beginnings of it. But I don't think that we've really been persecuted the way other 
believers have around the world for the last 2,000 years outside of North America. Um, there are places where if they find out you're a believer, uh, they will stake you down to uh, the sand, stir up the anthill, and cover your body with jam, and then let the ants go to town on you. You know? Uh, yeah, stuff like that. So... Um, sometimes Jesus will ask us to honor him by the giving of our lives like that. But what he's really calling us to do is to honor him by living our lives as pleasing to him. Now, such a sacrifice, it says in this very verse, is acceptable to God. <laughs> okay, uh, In the course of his repentance toward God, King David wrote his truly humble Psalm 51. And in verses 16 and 17 of that song, it reads, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Paul's saying the same thing right here. Uh, in fact, he's saying this is our reasonable service. Now, <laughs> the, the Greek word here uh, for spiritual is logikos. That's where we get our English word, logical. Uh, now, do you understand? Our service is to be a reasonable service. It's logical. It's, it's to at least have some basic order. It should have easy-to-follow methods and even some rules, if you like. Now, before anyone even whispers that word legalistic at me, Christ has completed the law, brothers. Uh, these things are to be thankful responses, not enforced rules. You understand? Um, we are, as I once heard Sinclair Ferguson explain, to be learning the principles of how to live as a Christian. Now, we don't do that because anyone forces us to obey the rules. And some people really do need the rules. And that's okay. Um, oh, Dan, did you find us? Yeah. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay. Uh, what's going on? There's a DA here, so I'm not sure who that is. That's me. Okay, so you did, you did find the online bit. That's cool. Okay. There's a DA on my screen about Dan, and that's the name I entered with, so I conclude that it's me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing it used the first two letters of your name, so. How you doing, Da? <laughs> All right. Um, and, and I just got pictures, so. Okay, I'm fair enough. Sure. What you really need to hear things is a speaker. Oh, it's, it's okay. I understand, brother. The, the phone is a good stopgap for now. Now, where was I? Christ uh, has completed the law. These things uh, are to be thankful responses and not enforced rules. Um, we are, uh, we don't do what we do because anyone forces our compliance to rules. Uh, we do it really because we love the Lord and we want to please him in everything that we do. That's not legalism by any definition. Um, it's the service that we owe God for saving our lives when he had absolutely no reason to do so. So we owe him our lives, and they should be lived in dedication to him. But wait, <laughs> there's more. Um, yeah, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed or, or shaped or fashioned to this age. The word in Greek is aeonian, or actually aeon, not, not aeonian, that's plural. Uh, aeon. A and that, that, that means age. But why not? What's wrong with this age? Well, since you asked, <laughs> uh, 
it's part of the present world system. Now, the word for world is typically cosmos, but here it's aeon, and it usually indicates that the age is a fixed length period of time that eventually will come to an end. And that's as near as I can get to what this is talking about. Um, as for what's wrong with the age, well, everything, what, what's right with it. Um, it's under the control of the Prince of Darkness, Grimm. Okay? All those that allow themselves to be put into the mold that the world has for them will be faced with incredible and injurious pressure. Okay? But what's the alternative? Well, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the Greek word for transformed is metamorpho. Um, and that's where we get our English word metamorphosis. Anybody actually ever heard the English word metamorphosis before? Okay. Uh, okay, well, you probably know uh, that it means quiet and often uh, hidden change from one state to another. Now, I first encountered this word in a very different way than most. I have not always been involved in theology. I studied entomology in university. That's a division of biology, dealing with insects. I know a very lot about a very lot of little bugs. <laughs> okay. Um, now, metamorphosis is actually an entomological term, um, and it describes what happens to an insect larva in the pupil stage of development. That's the short way of saying it, trust me. Uh, now, I know this is going to cause all kinds of weirdness and questions, okay? Uh, so I'm going to explain. Has anyone here ever heard of a butterfly? Yes, please, yeah, okay. All right. Now, a butterfly, is it born a butterfly? Vocal answers are fine. No. That's right, it's not. Uh, it starts out life as an egg, and when the egg hatches, uh, it's called a larva. Specifically the first instar larva, but that's another issue. Um, and a butterfly larva is called a caterpillar. So you see, it's not just farm equipment, right? <laughs> uh, because scientists in general need to sound smart to other scientists, they are continually inventing new words for the same thing. So a caterpillar is also called a butterfly nymph. Okay. Uh, now, in case you've never heard that terminology, and I, I hope you have, you have now. Um, I know it's complicated, but it's good to learn new words. So... Um, that caterpillar goes through a number of size changes, also known as nymphal changes, where it actually sheds its outer skin to make room for what's inside and getting bigger. Um, these are also called instars. Don't ask, I don't know. Um, until after a final eating binge, it goes into its final instar stage, which is called a pupa. Plural, pupae, also known as a cocoon. Um, now, if I were to say that in science ease, I, because really these guys speak their own language sometimes, I would say that the caterpillar has entered its pupal state, or call it a final instar stage. Now, the pupa is something that basically just hangs in place um, where it's formed. And in the case of the butterfly, absolutely amazing changes take place where it's formed in, in the cocoon. And the process that happens in the pupa is called metamorphosis. Um, so when the butterfly emerges from the pupa, and unfolds its wings for the very first time, the creature is, in a way, born again to new life. 
And if you look at it, a caterpillar, and then look at a butterfly and compare them, and I've also compared their internal morphologies by dissection, so I do know what I'm talking about here. Uh, what you will conclude is there, that there must have been a whole lot going on under the hood that nobody could see. Because if you hold up a... a, a you are now muted. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, <laughs> the great mutation, which is why I'm trying to get away from this stuff. Okay, uh, where was I? Um, now, like what happened to the butterfly, as for the Christian, we're not really inside a cocoon. Um, our metamorphosis takes place by the renewing of our minds. Um, and who controls that and its timing? Well, like the butterfly, God does. No butterfly ever fights its way out of its cocoon. Um, you know, and the cocoon, like it, it's trapped in there until it can get out. But no butterfly ever emerges from that without being completely transformed. The butterfly goes through this once. The Christian, we go through it repeatedly, probably for the remainder of our lives, because no butterfly ever emerges from its metamorphosis unchanged or in the same state as it went in. If it does, actually, it dies. And the birds eat it, and it's really sad, and we all have a funeral and go home. But... That's not what happens. It comes out. It spreads its wings. It can fly. Whereas it never could before. Now, does this say something about this process that occurs to the Christian repeatedly for the remainder of our lives? I think it does. And I think it tells us that as beautiful as a butterfly is, what we are becoming is so far beyond what we can even imagine that any trial we endure here, any struggle that we go through in our spiritual formation will be worth it. Now, how does this occur? I've said before, by the renewing of our minds. Now, Vine, in his expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words, calls that the adjustment of moral and spiritual vision and thinking to the mind of God, which is designed to have a transforming effect upon the life. So in those trials that we have been properly speaking of since chapter 7 at least, a whole lot is going under, on under the hood for the Christian, and their own choices are playing in a part of their sanctification to produce that spiritual beauty that will glorify God for an eternity. And it has another and present purpose. It says here that you may prove what the will of God is. And that word prove means more like to approve by examination or learning. Um, oh, look at that. More support to say the Christian needs to learn what to do about how to please God once he's regenerated them. <sighs> and if that is... Look, it isn't as if God is asking us to do things we don't want to do here, okay? Uh, I hear about, I see it, I talk to a number of people that seem to have this irrational fear of doing what God wants. Uh, they seem to be afraid that God wants to reach into their room and drag them off to deepest, darkest Africa... Uh, and they don't want to go. Or, or you know, uh, maybe God will make you marry a toad. <laughs> uh, or whatever, right? Please press 1 to mute or unmute yourself. 4 or 6 to decrypt. You are now muted. You are now unmuted. So apparently I'm having issues with mutations tonight. <laughs> That's another genetic <laughs> entomological thing. <laughs> uh, anyway... All right, 
Um, friends, we have to remember that God will never do any violence whatsoever to the will of the creature, according to two, at least, at least two very famous uh, confessions of faith that I've even quoted and named in our studies before now. He just won't. Um, you don't want to do something? That's okay. Be adult about it, though. I mean, you make the choice. You and you alone are going to have the consequences that go with it. Um, and you may not be the only one who has to live with your choice. So to fathers, think about this. What about your kids? To singles, what about your future life's partner? What, what are they going to think about this? Um, to children, what are your parents going to say? <laughs> That's an easy one. And to everyone else, what about the people around you that will have to deal with both you and the consequences that are yours? You know, friends, I'm talking about real spiritual choices here. No, find the will of God. You know why? Because the will of God is good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. And not just for you. <laughs> um, why? Well, it really isn't about you anyway. Okay? God wanting you to do... Okay, somebody's unmuted. I'm catching this weird echo. So God wanting you to do what he says is nothing but good for you. I don't really care what the consequences are. You think about who wrote this and how his life ended, okay? Paul was speaking about something that he knew intimately and believed to be true because the Lord had shown him. The Lord wants to show you too. And that's kind of what this chapter is about. That's the first paragraph. And we spent quite some time in just two verses. The rest of it will go a little quicker, I promise. Now, verses 3 to 8, I talked about the... Uh, uh, it talked about to me the exercise of spiritual powers and gifts. Uh, now, with all of that said, it seems to me to be very clear that none of us can do any of this stuff, uh, at least not without a lot of supernatural help. Um, and some may even object to my use of the term supernatural. Now, I'm actually using that word in its proper context. Uh, that which occurs above the realm of the natural. Okay, and who should always be involved in a supernatural experience for a Christian? No matter who or what else is, God should be in the form of the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts. Now, if he's involved, it doesn't really matter who else is. And how is God, through the Holy Spirit, expressing himself in the world today? Well, according to John 17, it is the followers of Christ gathered together the church and that's the context of everything now that i have to say so let's get into it uh verse three says for though the for uh through the grace given to me i say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as god has allotted to each a measure of faith Hmm. Sorry about that. So the Apostle Paul is saying here that God has given him grace to say this. Right after all this wonderful talk about how we're supposed to be living sacrifices and not dying ones to God, and how he's renewing our minds and making us holy and pleasing him, uh, uh, through our struggles, that he will give us good, acceptable, and perfect things in a spiritual sense as a result. And nobody, he, here's the grace, that here's what God gave Paul the grace to say. Nobody should think more of themselves than they should. Don't get on your high horse. Don't let it go to your head. Don't be proud. Pride, after all, was the sin of Lucifer that caused him to fall. Instead, rather think with sound judgment. 
Paul uses this phrase in a few places elsewhere. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 12, 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, elsewhere. It's the same phrase that's translated sound mind or self-control. So literally, Paul is saying, get a hold of yourself, <laughs> okay? Um, rein yourself in. If you've been exposed to horses, you'll know what I mean. Control yourself. Why? From the text... Because God has allotted to each believer a measure of faith. Now, verse 4. For, we, for just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. Now, Paul is beginning an analogous statement, one of the most famous actually, and he's not the only one to have adopted this. Um, he's making a comparison between the collective group we call the saints or believers and a human body. Here, he's saying that a body has many members, and those members are not the same at all. Uh, verse 5, So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of another. Or one of another, sorry. Uh, Paul here is saying that the collective body of those who follow Christ are one body in Him. This is one of the places that the church is called the body of Christ. Now what does that mean? Well, literally, it makes us closer than family. Um, we're part of the same body. Please note, this is not an organization. Uh, it's rather and better described as organic having more in common with a living body than a dead corporate grouping. We are members one of another. If we are all believers, we're closer than family, and that's kind of a like-it-or-not proposition. Um, we'll get into why that is later, I think, in the book, but um, suffice it to say, this is what Christ did. These are the effects. If you don't like them, that's still the way they are. And if you don't like that, well, I suppose you could leave, but where are you going to go? <laughs> Verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. Now, Paul here is uh, getting into a passage that at least is very clear to me. Uh, but sadly, I see deliberately misinterpreted, especially by the group I will call charismaniacs. Um, you know, uh, chuckle if you like. I suppose it's designed to sound funny, but um, I think I could best define a charismaniac as an over-the-top Pentecostal continuationist charismatic that sees everything either in terms of demons behind everything they don't agree with or the ability to make incoherent babblings they call tongues or angelic languages when no angel recorded in scripture anywhere spoke anything but what man spoke, so no evidence of a heavenly language anywhere. So what's the big deal? Well, we're talking about spiritual gifts here. Uh, they're given to us by God at the same time as our justification. What's yours? Do you know? Uh, how can you find out? Um, well, what are you most comfortable doing around the church? Um, in that context, maybe the gift includes hospitality. Do you love to entertain the saints? Uh, how about leadership? Is there some kind of project or body at, uh, at the church? Or, uh, yeah, that the body that, that you can get involved with, essentially. Um, there are all kinds of things, teaching, evangelism, missions, helps, you name it. Um, and it is within you a unique mix of maybe all of these. Um, and we, Because it says here that we have gifts that differ regarding to the grace, and grace is an undeserved gift, which is given to us. Why are we given these gifts? Well, to use them to serve the body as a whole. Each of us is to exercise our gifts accordingly. Paul begins to speak to specifics 
and their usage within the body of Christ. He uses specific the specific example here of prophecy. Now today, I think that's best equated with teaching the Word of God and how it applies not only to us as individuals and as a body, the church, but as how it applies to how you live your life. Why are we doing these things? What's going to happen in the future? We don't know, but here are some of the broad brushstrokes we do know. That's all prophetic. And it's not the only gift Paul lists here. Verse 7, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching. So there's two more specific examples. The first, service. Who in your local gathering seems just to be able to get things done in terms of repairing the building, setting up, taking down chairs, organizing the games at a fellowship, and keeping score, stuff like that. Uh, teaching, mentioned right here. Uh, that's the Greek word didaskos, um, or doctrine, if you like. Uh, it is what it says. Teaching's a gift, by the way. Uh, it's not necessarily a product of years in seminary or Bible college. Uh, this particular gift is one of mine, um, and I know it, and I have since the day I was saved in 1985. That's saying something there, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, look, I'm not that smart, so it must be a gift, right? Uh, it's got to be the Holy Spirit in me. <laughs> um, and, and, and look, a note, I'm not the best teacher I've ever heard either, okay? For example, I can't hold a candle to a John MacArthur or an R.C. Sproul or, or a Stephen Lawson, uh, all of whom I consider personally to be my mentors and examples, instructors of myself. Um, but it is my gift. And by its use, I both glorify God and serve the saints, which seems to be the purpose of those gifts, as you'll recall. Verse 8. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, the list continues. Okay, Exhortation. This gift is also known as encouragement because the word exhortation means to strongly encourage. Um, I think I have a little dose of this too sometimes, uh, although it seems to me to be best used in preaching the word to the saints for me, uh, or in counseling others, I suppose, as a pastoral exercise. Sometimes this gift must confront to encourage. Brother, you're not really doing the right thing over here, are you? This is kind of... You know, this is kind of sinful. Look here what the Word says we should be doing. Let's do that. How about that, brother? Can we pray? You know, and I've had conversations that went along those lines. Um, um, now, that should never be the main focus within the saints. And, and i got to tell you, I went to a place that for probably a good 12 of the 18 years I was there, that was the focus of it. And I'll tell you, it's no fun at all. Um, that kind of exercise should only happen in disciplined situations, and that should be really a rare and serious set of events. Um, giving. Giving, yes, it's a gift. Uh, I don't have a lot of this one. <laughs> Typically because I often lack the means. But I am familiar with the attitude. If I have it and you need it, brother, it's yours. Okay? Uh, but I'm not always able. I try and be that way. Um, leadership. Yes, also a gift from God. And it is to me a gift that can be very useful in sorting people out. Not as a leader per se, but from observing how people will respond to leadership. There are those who will follow leadership, and then there are those who will not. <laughs> okay? Um, yeah. Now, assuming those who will not follow leadership instructions uh, aren't anarchists, atheists, and criminals, um, those just might be leaders too. So... 
How do you find a leader? Find somebody who's not willing to follow the current leader's instructions. It's an interesting thought in a Christian context. Now, I recognize that sometimes the Christian context we're familiar with, we're dealing with actual unbelievers trying to act like Christians. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about within the midst of the saints. Now, leaders that uh, leaders are those that direct effectively and make decisions that affect everyone for good or for bad sometimes. Um, God gave them to the church so we can know where we're going. And the mark of leadership that Paul recognizes here is it the skill with which things are carried out? Is it the speaking ability and the organizational ability? No, it's diligence. Diligence is a word that describes a careful haste to act, um, an earnestness of that action, and an effort to complete it. Now, I'm told I have a bit of a dose of this as well, but uh, being lazy, I don't like to exercise it, right? <laughs> um, yeah, elders, keep me honest on that one, please. <laughs> so mercy, that's right. The ability to show mercy or perform acts of mercy is a gift from God for the churches building up to the glory of God. Who has a mind to feed the poor? To visit the sick, elderly, or injured, and offer helps to them. Um, those are all acts of mercy. Uh, and mercy itself here is from a word that means to pity, or to have compassion on, or to care about the welfare of the individuals in need. Show up at your brothers with a weed whacker, and clear a path to his oil tank kind of thing, just as a, uh, a personal example. Okay, that was me, and the brother caught me at it, <laughs> which kind of toned down the, the gift for me. But, um, you know, such acts should be done with cheerfulness. Um, and it, what does that mean? Well, the, it's the very same word used in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word is hilarotes. Uh, and it's where we get our English word hilarious, but it has a very different meaning. Uh, it speaks rather to the exuberance and the enthusiasm that goes into the performing of a pleasing action to the target audience. Now, I should mention that this is not, I believe, an exhausted li exhaustive list. Uh, a similar passage passage in Ephesians 4 also lists evangelists and pastors and apostles as gifts. <coughs> um, there are people who say, there's no apostles today, there's no apostles today. And, and I would actually agree with that in the old school original 12 cents. But the office still exists. And the, somebody's un, unmuted something. But the the uh, the uh, the office is all about uh, church planting and bringing to birth new gatherings and restructuring and and kind of like a supervising of the leadership uh, in, in that kind of capacity, like uh, the sober second voice, as it were. That that's kind of what that is. Um, in fact, uh, that list in that passage in Ephesians four, uh, tells us that these gifts are all given for the building of the church. If, uh, verses 11 to 13 read, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So then, these spiritual gifts that were given in grace to us when we were saved by God, were given to us not for our own benefit, but rather to glorify God 
and to build up the corporate man, the body of Christ. And we must exercise them. Or, see if you can think of anybody this might apply to, we will grow frustrated and eventually bitter at the very church we are supposed to be serving. Even though that can be from the Lord to teach things. I won't give details for this, but I do know what I'm talking about firsthand, and I think some of you brothers do too. Um, with all these gifts given, who cannot see that we'll have a code of behavior and ethics that are going to go with it? Okay, Anybody got their hand up? I don't. <laughs> okay. um, remember, for the flesh, all those churchians that are in the flesh that sort of try to flock to the gathering and overpower it and ruin it and turn it into something that the world can live with. Um, they're going to try and substitute all of this stuff with rules and codes and vows and stuff like that. For the believer, this is more like an instruction manual to joy and fulfillment in the church. Um, so verses 9 to 13, our behavior towards other believers. Now, it's critical at this point to note that while there is a real exercise of behaviors and a way we are supposed to act and reasons for the actions we perform, there's a counterfeit and legalistic version of this that will pop up alongside the real exercise wherever it occurs. I've seen it in everything from Brethren Assemblies to Baptist churches and everything in between. Okay, uh, I will repeat for vital emphasis that this is not a list of things that will make you a Christian. This is a list of things that Christians will naturally gravitate toward doing so that they can be filled with joy when we do these things for the glory of God. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And I'm sorry here, we're going to have to slow down a little bit again, because I have seen a lot in this particular verse. Very short verse, very powerful. Okay, so the apostle here covers some basics of what is supposed to be the Christian behavior. The very first thing that he talks about as you would expect, is about love, okay? And the word for love used in Greek is agape. That's divine, self-giving, self-sacrificing love, God's love. The love that the Holy Spirit gives us so that we may give it again, because I'm not sure that humans are really very capable of giving, the, giving this way of themselves apart from being moved by the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking of that proverbial soldier who saves his buddies by diving on the grenade that might have been moved by the holy spirit too you just don't know now that kind of love is supposed to be without hypocrisy hypocrisy comes from a word that literally means a play acted answer <laughs> um, or a fake reply or fake behavior if you will now this usually demonstrates itself to those who have discernment exercised as all about the individual speaking and not about the Lord. Uh, what I mean by this, uh, this is someone who stands up and said, I did this and I, I did this because I'm so spiritual and I'm so humble. Look at me, praise me, 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 I, me. Okay, ever hear anybody do that? I'm betting people come to mind when I just said that. <laughs> Uh, and I want to be very clear when I'm saying this. I am not talking here about people who use personal examples in ministry. Okay, that's, you know, I got a story. I lived this and maybe it'll help you. That's a different thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm talking about people that push their way to the podium, demand your attention, and once they have, uh, have it, they tell you about something, but turn the occasion into a commercial about themselves. Okay? Have nothing to do with these individuals, if you possibly can. Um, 
And if such an individual has manipulated or engineered or otherwise bullied their way into a position of authority in your gathering, you may have a big issue, okay? Some of us know that firsthand as well. Be as kind as you can to such a one, okay? And preach the gospel to them. Uh, be low-key about it, because if you're anything other than low-key, it might set them off. And the idea with the gospel is to reach through the shielding that people throw up and touch their hearts with it. Um, you know, um, you never know. The Lord might have mercy on them, because love and mercy are his very nature. So, hey. Um, second half of the verse. Abhor what is evil, cling to what's good. Uh, abhorrence is basically a synonym for hatred. Um, hate what is evil. What is evil? Well, everything the Bible defines as evil, I suppose. After that, you have to have at least some biblical criteria for making that kind of decision. Um, and if you're having trouble, seek godly counsel in your local gathering if need be. But learn to do this for yourself. And here's, a, here's one you can practice on. A fella had an opportunity to sell advertising for, let's say, the Ottawa Sun. Now, he had already spoken to the manager of the sales department. He was very impressed, and the offer had been made, but the individual said, I want to pray about this. He actually said this to the manager. I want to pray about this. I want to make sure I'm making the right decision. And the guy says, no problem, but if I could get ask you to get back to me fairly quickly, because there are other candidates that are lined up, but I got to tell you, you're the guy. If you want this job, it's yours. So he didn't know what to do. He went, he spoke with, uh, he spoke with one of his church leaders. His church leader didn't actually know. So his church leader phoned another church that was affiliated with by denomination and spoke to one of their church leaders who had encountered a similar issue. He spoke with that brother for about two minutes flat. And the net upshot of the conversation was, is, well, it sounds good. What kind of advertising are you going to sell? Well, I would sell basically pretty much the want ad section. Um, and, by the way, that includes all the call girls that put uh, ads in for their prostitution services. What do you think that boy's answer was? Yeah. Brother, you can't do that. You can't take that job. <laughs> you really can't. You cannot take a job that's going to lead people into a sin. You can't. Not and call yourself a Christian. Um, anyway, that's kind of what we're talking about there, okay? Um, you don't have to turn yourself, however, into a crusader and begin to prosecute sin, okay? Um, unless God calls you to be a police officer or something like that. that that's a very different thing. Okay, rather cling to what is good. Now, the word for cling to in Greek literally means to glue yourself to it. Uh, so, uh, what is good? Well, God starts the list. His principles uh, should probably be up near the top of that list. Your fellow believers are on that list because of John chapter 17. And anything else that the Word of God says is good. Okay? Um, glue yourself to that and study it. Instead of maybe gluing yourself to the TV like I've been known to do. Um, you know, um, for non-Christian shows. I'm a sci-fi nut. I, you know, that's just me. Um, especially in this silly lockdown where there isn't a whole lot else to do. Um, <laughs> you know, um, unless maybe you want to improve yourself. <clears throat> for example, did you know that Ligonier Ministries has made all of their teaching material free online? during this lunacy. Uh, HTTP colon double slash Ligonier.org will get you to the front page. Uh, have a look around. Do you know that Stephen Lawson's series on the attributes of God is up there? 
Wow, let me tell you, that's a powerful view, okay? I've seen it. It's amazing stuff. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. The next behavior? Well, how about devotion to the saints and brotherly love? Now, this is an interesting kind of a statement for me, because the word for devotion has the idea of family attached to it. We've already been talking about this a little bit, okay? Um, it actually is a form of the Greek word storge, which is the word for family love, like the godly love of a father for his children. Um, this is how we are to view each other as members of a close family. And the word for brotherly love here is Philadelphia, and we're not talking about the city, okay? Um, it means you, the affection one has for one's siblings, okay? And who is this all toward? One another. You can't really be much clearer than that, can you? Okay, I mean, and how do we do that? Give preference to one another. Now, this literally means to lead one another in doing honor. Uh, or, or rather, maybe outdo one another in showing honor. <clears throat> now, when I was a younger believer, um, I was maybe uh, two years old in Christ, maybe less, I had a brother in the faith by the name of Randall, and he and I used to joke that the only kind of a fight a Christian was really allowed to have was who would allow the other one out the door first. <laughs> um, now, seriously, uh, though we can easily turn things into one-upsmanship, and that's bad. So there's a need for care here. Stick to the spirit and the meaning here. Place the interests of someone else before your own interests. Because remember, it's not all about you. Verse 11. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Don't lag behind in diligence. Well, lagging here means to shrink back or to hesitate or to delay. Now, don't do that about diligence. We've already talked about what diligence is. A careful haste to act, an earnestness of action, and an effort in the completion of business. Just get on with it. Be earnest and work at it. Um, if I could redeem a line from the movie Deadpool, and that's hard enough, um, I would say... Maximum effort. Okay, fervent in spirit. The word for fervent means literally hot or boiling. Now, many have misinterpreted a key passage of scripture because they don't understand this. Um, Revelation 3, verses 14 and 15, uh, in the, it says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, I've heard that taught in a church that I was a member of, that you need to either be hot or cold, but lukewarm is what gets rejected. The teacher that night flat out says it was a, it, that it was okay to be cold because God can still enjoy, enjoy a good cold dish of something like ice cream. Charismaniacs, what are you going to do? <laughs> Not the only temperature, the, the only temperature that Paul ever, ever endorsed was hot. Why? Well, God's simply going to pass over the cold. But the lukewarm, those who are trying to warm themselves up, aren't going to make the grade. The hot is what he's after, not the lukewarm, and certainly not the cold. Um, be hot in your spiritual pursuits. Put energy into it. Serving the Lord. Now the word uh, for serving here is based on the word doulos, which is the Greek word for slave. Be his slave. Has he asked you to do something? Yes. <laughs> okay. Then have that request in your hot pursuit. Okay. Let me put that into another set of words. 
seek to actively obey his command. <clears throat> Verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Be filled with joy or happiness, that word blessing if you like. The word rejoice is actually interesting in its construction. I believe joy is a Latin word, which means to be filled with exuberance. Uh, and the prefix of re adds a sense of that having exuberance needs to be a continual kind of a thing. So have happiness and keep having happiness or exuberance. Now, persevere can be translated uh, by the word endure or remain under the circumstances. And, and what are we supposed to endure here? Well, tribulation, of course. Affliction. Suffering. Why? Well, it's how all of these things are taught to you. Okay? Have you ever prayed, Lord, give me more patience? Like that? What happens? Anybody want to take a crack at that? What happens when you pray to the Lord for patience? Sometimes he gives me more trials for my patience. I don't know. What do you think, Alex? I heard Dan, so. Uh, well, uh, usually uh, the Lord will place you in a congregation with people uh, who will test your patience. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, and that's kind of the point, right? whether you noticed it or not, all of a sudden you found yourself in situations that tried your patience, right? Why is that? Um, well, that's how you train people. Do you ever think about that? Um, you have people uh, set goals. In this case, they're doing so by praying. And the goal that they're making is to have more patience. And then you present them with opportunities to develop the skills that are required for that goal. People that will test your patience are there to create more opportunities for you to practice patience so that when the day comes, you get it right. Now, I'm not going to say anything glib like careful what you pray for here, okay? Because that's a good prayer, okay? Uh, who doesn't want or need more of that? Pick your goal. Need more humility? Ask the Lord. He will provide more opportunities for you to be humble. Now, I will say, and I don't say it glibly, be careful with that request because being humble is good. And as you practice it, it becomes easy. Being humbled against your will is called humiliation in English. And no one likes that as necessary as it seems to be at times. So be careful. What else does it say? It says to be devoted to prayer. Another way of saying this in English is continually attending to earnest and honest communication with God regarding your needs or matters of importance. Okay? Uh, again, I, I don't think you can get a whole lot more clear than that. So there you are. Uh, verse 13. Contributing to the needs of the saints practicing hospitality so contributing to the needs of the saints that could mean a lot of different things the one that always first pops up from my mind is is well that saint doesn't have a lot of money we should give him more money but it can mean a lot of different things depending on how many saints we're talking about at a time james approaches this topic from a reverse angle he says uh if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And that's James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, if you want the verse. So what are you saying, Paul? Well, if you know of a need in the life of one or more saints, it's up to you to do what you can to fill it up. Um... We have, under this COVID-19 lockdown, a great opportunity right now to shine. Um, let's say I had money. I don't, but let's say. Um, 
I actually have the papers to prove it, uh, 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 trustee to testify, so whatever. Um, I knew a brother needed some groceries, say, and was actually going hungry because he had no ability to get to a grocery store and buy some. Now, that's an activity, interestingly, that's maddeningly allowed under this. Uh, uh, we're allowed to break quarantine for that, and we still aren't allowed to meet as the local church in Ontario. Uh, hint, hint, Mr. Ford! <laughs> okay, it's incumbent on me that as that, as that saint's spiritual family to make sure that his or her needs are met. I could go stock his fridge for him, or as uh, on as regular a basis as I could probably afford. And and brothers, don't make any mistake on this. That's what they did in Acts chapter two. Um, let's say a brother needed help to clean his basement, so that the small church he pastors. Um, has an emergency place to meet during lockdown. <laughs> um, of course, being careful to observe Ontario safety protocols. <laughs> now, if I had a strong back in a few hours' time, I'd risk the trip to the place and clean out his basement for him according to the need. See, there's more than one way to serve the saints. Uh, and it's okay, we got the basement covered. I live with a teenager and Guess what his job is. <laughs> now, there is a bit of a twist here, though. A brother could be asking you because he's just being lazy. Okay? Does that mean we should not help said brother under the principle of the man will not work, he should not eat? I don't think that's what that's talking about exactly. We should still help our brother. But he's taking advantage of me. You know, I, I heard that back in the upper deck on the left corner of the room. Um, you know what Paul said to that? Why not rather be wronged? Somebody taking advantage of you? Why not rather be wronged? Um, however, my help in that case might come with some words of exhortation to be hot and not cold to said brother if you get my meaning, and should said brother end a friendship over this, well, pray for them. Uh, the individual made their choice, and we're supposed to be in our Father's image, so no violence should be done to their will. Just like that. Now, my experience when somebody's done that to me is that the Lord brings them back around into your path a few years later and a few grades humbler. Not sure how that works, really, but seems to be what happens. Um, <clears throat> practicing hospitality. Now, I wondered what that meant, so I looked up some Greek stuff, and it really means pursue the love of strangers. Um, it's not about being kind to people at your local gathering. That's already a given, okay? We're supposed to be treating people uh, with kindness, uh, especially those who are believers in the gathering where we go. Okay, but um, this is about being kind and good to Christians who you do not know and who are from outside of your fellowship. The potential here is to head off that ugly, ugly cliqueishness, I guess, that we're often accused of. Um, and how we're always, and I heard it put this way some time ago, uh, and I sadly do find some truth to it. Uh, that we are, quote, using our Calvinism to exclude as many as possible from their little elect club and becoming a holy huddle, unquote. Now, if you've ever been a part of a group that's done that, you'll get the gist, Calvinism or no. Um, how do you treat Christians that are not a part of your gathering? Are they brothers and sisters in Christ? Or are they all just heretics that are going to feed the fire? I've experienced both. Please, friends, I want to be a brother of Christ. I don't, I don't ever want to be the heretic. Okay. Um, 
So these are ways that we should be treating those who share with us the adoption as sons of God. Uh, they too are sons of the Most High uh, and children of the King of Kings. Now, if we cannot treat them with that kind of respect, then we must remember what Jesus said in response to Peter when he cried out. Now, the circumstances were the rich young ruler, uh, Jesus said, well, sell all you have, come follow me. And he said, uh, oh, no, I can't do that. And he wandered off and he went away very sad. And, and Jesus turned to his disciples and he said uh, uh, something like, how very hard it is for the rich man to come into the kingdom of God. And his disciples said to him, and I think it was identified in one of the Gospels as Peter, uh, said, well, then who can be saved? <laughs> Jesus answered him and he said, um, sorry, he said, these things are impossible with men, but with God all things are possible. God can change you. God needs to change you. Pray for God to change you the way he needs to change you to make, him, make you like his son. Okay? Um, this is an opportunity to become the person God wants you to be. He has made you, whether you realize it or not, a special gift to his people for his glory. Go find out what your gifting is. Find out what you should be doing to serve the saints in your local gathering. And that brings us to our last paragraph, verses 14 to 21, our behavior toward unbelievers. Now, if the preceding is how we're supposed to treat those who are believers, how should we treat those who are not? Well, if your solution is make fun of them because it's funny, sit down and be very ashamed of yourself. And now rejoice because Paul's going to tell us exactly what it's supposed to be. Verse 14. <clears throat> Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. But Jerry, they're persecuting us. We need to fight back. We need to take action. We need to beat them into submission. No, we don't. We need to bless them and not curse them. You know, uh, the word here for bless is the word eulogio in Greek. It means to speak well of or to praise. We get our word eulogy from it. Um, I don't think that means we have to be false in our behavior towards them. Okay, but it goes right back to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5.41 says, Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now, in that time of Roman occupation, a member of the Roman contingent could stop anyone at any time and make you carry his stuff for one mile. Basically, it was to spell off the tired soldier a little bit. So he could get back to base, give him a bit of a break. But he could not force you under Roman law to go further than one mile. Um, Christians were instructed by Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount to volunteer to go that far again. This has become known as going the extra mile. And I have to say, this doesn't deal with debates or exchanges of ideas either. I'm talking about persecution, and I don't think any of us here have ever really experienced that. Although, you know, I look around and I can see it, you know, it's, it's, over the it's not over the horizon anymore. I can see it in plain view coming. Um, the word persecute is an interesting word as well. It means literally to put to flight. And this is why I say we haven't really experienced it here. Uh, no one's chased me out of my house yet. So I don't think I've ever really suffered real persecution in the physical sense. Um, but it can stop you from doing things. So maybe there's another sense to this. Um, example, we were out once preaching the gospel out in the open air. And a person who was very agitated, she ran up to us. She told us we didn't have the right to be doing it especially not to be doing it here underneath the Prime Minister's office on the corner of the Langevin block. 
uh, and that they were going to call the police. So the police arrived, and nothing happened, as you'd expect. In fact, it didn't even break up the preaching. Um, but there were a few tense people around until it got cleared up. I wasn't tense. I was actually preaching. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, you know, uh, another time we were using the Andrew Hayden Park, uh, you know, their band shell to practice. Uh, I used to be in a band called Morning Star back in the late 80s. Um, and a couple of, he couple of hecklers were very clearly angered by our open use in the evening air to sing our gospel uh, uh, to actually all we were doing was practicing but we were putting on sort of like a mini impromptu concert I guess because it was you know like a dress rehearsal we were all wearing shirts that said Morning Star and whatever um, and they shouted out ironically I have to refer to my notes because uh, it's really kind of funny that Canada is a free country and we shouldn't be allowed to spread our superstition. How's that for irony of the year 1989? <laughs> okay, uh, I, I basically, I just agreed with them. Um, and all I did was I said something like, you know, you're correct. Canada is a free country. And you shouldn't be allowed to uh, contradict yourself so ironically. That didn't go over, didn't go over well at all. <laughs> My point is, bless and do not curse. Okay? Answering them intelligently, by the way, is not cursing them. Cursing them is, yeah, and your mother too. You know, that, something like that. that that's not good. Um, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, this isn't telling us to follow the throng as I have occasionally heard suggested. Uh, instead, it's telling us that it's important for us to be human while others are facing human trials. Um, let's say you're in a sales job of some sort. I'm familiar with that. I, I've been in sales for a number of years. Okay, um, A colleague that you work with closed a sale that maybe you failed at closing. And what is our tendency? It's to become very jealous and start to knock them and Try and knock them down to your level again. They did something you couldn't. And that's wrong. Um, rejoice with them or her. Rejoice with him or her. They did a hard thing. You couldn't do it. They got it done. They deserve the accolades that they're getting for it. Participate in them. Be happy for them. On the other side of the coin, maybe someone's lost their spouse of 20 years to cancer. You know, it's okay to feel things, um, and it's okay to live in the moment. The important part is that you will be seen to be different, and that can cause good and even profitable conversations about the gospel, either right there or maybe down the road. You don't know. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Where's the harm? Weep with those who weep. Be human. Verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Now, it does not say here, have the same mind, um, because we're not, some, we're not part of some giant hive mind like the Daleks or Cybermen of Doctor Who fame. Okay? Uh, we should be of the same mind toward one another, not have the same mind as one another. Um, now, what could that mean? I, I think it might have something to do with thinking the same thoughts, thinking in the same way. My brother is wiser than I. My brother needs these things more than me. My sister is more blessed the, than I, and that's good. Um, you know, like that. How, how about this? My brother and sister are both worthy of respect, and I will not lose my temper when they anger me. What would that look like if that were the case? Hmm. Now, here's another one. Don't be haughty in mind. Don't be high-minded. Okay, Don't have your nose stuck in the air. Uh, what does it say to do instead? Well, associate with the lowly. Who are they? Well, the outcasts, the downcasts. The people that sit along the wall during the dance. Okay, you know who I mean. 
because you've either seen them there or more likely you're like me and you've been one of those people. Okay? You can help. So help. But don't get, uh, in the last part of the verse, do not be wise in your own estimation. You know what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying, don't get too big for your britches. Okay? As the saying goes. Nobody likes a know-it-all. Nobody likes folks that insist on using $50 words without explaining them. Or when a 50 cent word would do. And I don't, and listen, don't think you're the only one with the solutions to the problems. Um, a day's coming when an angel is going to have to fly across the heavens to preach the everlasting gospel. Because man can't anymore. There either won't be any Christians to do it, or if there are, they'll be hiding so that they're not picked off by snipers. You know? Um, you know, there could be a million reasons for that. Um, and if we stop to speculate on those reasons, we'd probably be here all night, so I'll just move on. Uh, verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And what's the wisdom of the world on this one? <laughs> don't get mad. Get even. Or, or better, don't get mad. Don't get even. Get ahead. <laughs> okay. Come out on top and get more back. Uh, do you understand the significance of that? Paul is writing this to Rome. Okay, the very government of Rome itself is an open knife fight on the floor of the Senate. And you can ask the guy about 120 years before this, whose name was Julius, about that. Okay, um, no, instead, bless and not curse, right? Um, there is more coming with reason, so I'll say more than we get there. But respect, then it says, respect what is right in the sight of all men. Um, now, all men actually means in this passage, all men. Um, and that's important to keep in mind here. We should respect that. Um, there are things in society today that are right. It's not all just bad out there. There are things that are built into it that we somehow likely and largely through Christian influence, we got right. Uh, protections for the poor and disabled are among those things in Canada. Um, we have something here called universal health care. doesn't matter if you can't pay, you get treatment because you're sick. And it's not about how much money you have, it's about how sick you are. And, and, and further, in, in the Constitution of Ontario, that's been entrenched as a right. So, anyway... We should respect things like that. It's a good thing. Respect it when they're trying to do the right thing or benefit people in some way. Now, I'm, I'm not saying their ways don't have flaws and that those flaws shouldn't be civilly addressed or pointed out when necessary. Just respect it and don't take revenge. Verse 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard. Try going through life, preaching an unpopular message to everybody you meet, and not find somebody that has something against you. <laughs> but sometimes conflict is just going to occur with people. Sometimes it even occurs between believers. Uh, Paul mentions a pair of ladies, uh, I think it's in Colossians, where he talks about uh, two particular sisters named Euodia uh, uh, and Syntyche. Um, and they were at loggerheads with each other. But as much as within, is within us, we should be at peace with all men, especially believers. And if we can't be, then maybe the rest of us can help us. This is the benefits of belonging to the corporate man. Um because that's what happened with those two ladies I just mentioned. Just make sure the fault, if there's any, is not on your side of the fence. Uh, how's that said? Uh, clean up your own front yard or clean up your own side of the street first. 
Now, I'm not saying that there isn't going to be appropriate times where you need to build bridges for people that, you know, uh, don't like you very much, but that's another issue. Um, verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Did you catch that? It says here that God's going to repay on your behalf. <laughs> um, have you ever had someone try to spread rumors about you? I have. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, I was actually called, and I'm quoting here, a dangerous man that could snap and cause a lot of damage. End quote. Now, several of you know me. Uh, some of you have known me for 10 years or longer. Um... Some of you for longer than that. <laughs> um, yeah, hi. My wife could say the same too. Um, she's been knowing me for more than one decade. Uh, let's see. You know, I have to ask you, is that true? Am I a dangerous man that could snap and cause a lot of damage? No. Yeah, I didn't think so either. Um, of course it's not true. Now, this is kind of humorous to anybody that was there, but I included that statement in a recent pulpit, a recent pulpit supply sermon uh, where everyone in the congregation knows me and has known me for, again, longer than a decade. Um, and there was a collective first gasp of disbelief, followed by laughter and giggling in the crowd and the shaking of heads. <laughs> okay. Um, I know it's not true. The point is, is people are going to do this. And it's not something that we should ever try to do in Please return. One to mute or unmute yourself. Uh, are you still hearing me? To decrease or increase the conference volume. Five, to extend the conference. Seven or nine, to decrease or increase your volume. Or eight, to exit. Okay, I don't need to mute or unmute, so I'm just going to do nothing. Am I still uh, hearable? Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah, okay. Fair enough. May as well just wait for that. Um, okay, now this is a mild and comical uh, kind of event that occurred to me. Um, I can tell you worse stories that don't have the funny attached if you really like. I can tell two or, two or three that might make uh, the grown men here cry. Um, but I'm at peace. Why? Well, the Old Testament quote from Paul here says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. You know, now God said that in, I think, Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is not a new thing. Please mute whatever you got going over there. It's bleeding into the speakers and screwing me up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um... So I think God said that in Deuteronomy 32. And, and it's not about payback. It's about serving the Lord with the gifts he's given us for the building of the church, for the glory of God, and nothing else. And if you can't get over the insult, get out of the ministry, brother. Verse 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now that's an Old Testament quote from Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. If your enemy's hungry, give him food to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Because as you do, you do something. You heap burning coals on their head. Now that could mean a couple of things. The first meaning, and this seems to be the majority view here, is that you increase the punishment and wrath that God will visit on them in the day of judgment. However, a persistent view, although a decided minority says that you may be setting their conscience on fire when you do not respond in the way that essentially the rest of the planet does. Um, and I think actually it could be a combination of both, like a multi-leveled approach. 
That's never occurred in scripture. Okay. Um, yeah. Verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now here in the closing verse of the chapter is what I believe is a summary of this paragraph. In the world, you will face evil, and you will face hurtful people. Just like you used to be. And you are not to allow that to modify your behavior from the person God wants you to be. It also says, failure is not an option. Another way of stating that last verse is, never surrender to evil, but instead conquer evil with good. Evil is constant in its approach vector to us. It repeatedly assails us from all sides. But we will not surrender. We will endure. And in our endurance, we will overcome the assault of evil with good. That is, with everything that God tells us to do, and will thus lead us to overcome the world's assaults on us. Up to and including death if necessary, with his will for us. And that's from verse 2. Well, it's perfect. It's God's perfect will. It's also acceptable. At the time that you have to do it, it will seem like the acceptable thing to do. And what else is it? It's good. Yes, it's good. <clears throat> so what's the key for us here? Well, it's actually pretty easy. <laughs> Christianity is not about a set of rules that govern behavior, also known as religion. Um, it's an established spiritual reality already established in the heart of his followers. As we submit to God over time, we make ourselves a living and not a dying sacrifice. And instead of being pressured and molded by the world's plans for us, instead we're quiet and God begins to renew our mind. And even we don't always know what's going on, giving us instead a new motive for being. In fact, a new nature that views the world and its fleshly stupidity in a different way entirely. It allows us to form our own internally motivated code of behavior. That we do not perform to score points to get into heaven, but instead we allow ourselves to do to please the one that has already allowed us into heaven. Now this new and living way God has given us instinctively and tells us that we should be humble and obedient men and women to the Lord who made all of this possible on the tree at Calvary. And that's chapter 12. Hi, Jerry from Berean Nation. Uh, I'm so glad that you watched the study uh, that we just partook of. And uh, as always, the notes that I preach from for the study are available as of 9 p.m. that night on BereanNation.com, assuming the automation worked. And if it didn't, it might just take a little longer while I go back and fix the, the whole web thing. Um, normally, also, there's a live stream and you're watching kind of the doctored end of this. So if you would like uh, a copy of this message on DVD, it will be available for $10 Canadian plus shipping and handling. Um, that's just the cost of making stuff. I'm not interested in making money on this. The scripture says, buy the truth and sell it not. Um, that's just to cover costs of material and the time and effort I put in to producing your copy that you ask for. Uh, I got to tell you, all of this stuff's available for free on YouTube for as long as YouTube will let it be there. And, um, you know, I've got stuff saved to my hard drive as well. So, you know, if you find one that you can't find, give me a shout. Maybe I've got a copy of it somewhere. Um, if you have questions 
or if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at pastorjer at outlook.com. Pastor is actually the Latin spelling of pastor. It's pastor and it has an E on the end. Now, my name is actually Gerald, uh, and that starts with the letter G. And then it's outlook.com. So pastor, the Latin spelling for pastor, Jer, the German spelling for Jer, at outlook.com the Microsoft spelling for this is my email. Um, give me a shout. I'll be happy to engage with you uh, as long as you can get a hold of me uh, over that email. Now, uh, I should also let you know that we're on Patreon. Uh, go to patreon.com slash Berean Nation. This is a great way that if the Lord lays on your heart that you want to support this ministry, and I'm not asking you to, uh, just pray about it and do what the Lord tells you to do. That's what I would rather see. But if you want, it's like a dollar a month. There's another category that's like five up to, I think I think it's $20 a month kind of thing. If you would do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. And it's a way that you can be involved in the ongoing work of God through this ministry of Berean Nation. Our main focus is to get people to read the Word and study the Word in its original context so that people can understand the message that God has for them personally here today, and it is of relevance. Um, if you don't think you like that idea, you can actually uh, buy my book, Practical Discipleship, on Amazon.com. It's sold for $4 if you really need the hard copy, but here's the deal for you. If you like Kindle stuff, it's available for $0.99. Cents. Personally, I'm a fan of Kindle. Until the next sunspot wipes all our electronics out, right? But anyway, there it is. You can go get it. If you're in Ottawa, Canada, sh or if you're going to be, shoot me an email at pastorjaredoutlook.com. I'd be happy to get together with you, have coffee or whatever. Um... That's all there is to that. We've closed in prayer. God bless you. Keep searching the scriptures daily to make sure these things are so.